Welcome to the Web Marketing That Works podcast, episode 79. Welcome to the Web Marketing That Works podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. Hi there. My name is Toby Jenkins, and this is the Web Marketing That Works podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. This is the show for people who love marketing on the web. We take you behind the scenes of real-life marketing experiments to share the good and the bad and the ugly. In this show, I'm speaking with Peter Barnes. Now, Pete is an accountant, trained accountant, and a former finance journalist. He also progressed through Capital Finance Australia, to become the CEO of that business, and he is now the CEO of LearnFast, which is an education technology business. Today, we talk about what has and hasn't worked, and we dive into details, particularly around his realization of the power of inbound marketing, which I know we talk a lot about on this show. He also shares how they have created a huge surge of leads really recently in a very simple tweak in their email process and an experiment that they have going on right now. And he actually breaks that down into the frequency, the content that he's sharing, and I'll let you find that out for yourself, but it's amazing, and I really consider that a key insight from today's show. He also shares how he's planning to apply the idea of a product market fit to learn fast and to the audience that they've created now because they've built up a large database, and how can they reverse engineer products to fit that market that they have. This show is brought to you by our book, Web Marketing That Works, and specifically the bonus 33 free templates that go with it. If you'd like to get your hands on those, you can download them from bluewiremedia.com.au slash book. Let's jump into it. Pete, thanks so much for joining me today, mate. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Pleasure. Now, Pete, look, I've known you for a few years now, and you are just one of the most consistently energetic guys that I've met. How do you do it? What sort of fires you up each morning? <laughs> I guess the energy comes from the genes to a large extent. My dad was a bit like that too. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I just think everything is exciting, Toby. It just, the whole world is exciting. You know, if you want to be a little bit more specific than that, my family is extremely exciting to me and developing this business that I'm currently in, Learn Fast Australia, excites me because we've got the potential to impact the lives of millions of kids. Mm. Okay, so let's jump into that then. And if you could just tell us a bit of background in terms of your business journey, sort of, yeah, how's it sort of unfolded from the beginning? Oh, right. From the beginning, well, after I left university, I went into chartered accountancy and became a chartered accountant. And that sort of um, was fun for about 30 nanoseconds. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, I've had a, a varied journey. I've been a finance journalist. I've worked in human resource consulting and did a big stint in banking and finance. And I ended up CEO of um, Bank of Scotland's um, finance company out here back in the late 90s before going out on my own. Okay. And then, so what was the transition out of the banking then? Well, I left banking and kind of was just doing a bit of consulting. And then my wife had started a learning technology business, which is the extension to her speech pathology and learning center here in Linfield in Sydney. And she was just sort of, you know, it wasn't her thing. She didn't know what to do with it actually. Products were fabulous, so I started to help out there a little bit, and over a period of time, it evolved into a full-time role, so it's now six days a week kind of thing. And so, yeah, can you tell us a bit more about what LearnFast Australia looks like now then? Yeah, well, LearnFast Australia distributes a a number of neuroscience-based learning products which are delivered via technology over the web. The markets are schools, home users and professional clinics, learning centres and tutor centres and so forth in Australia and New Zealand. Okay. And so by a neuroscience product, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is I don't know if you've heard about the concept of brain plasticity. It got quite a lot of airtime over the last few years after a book written by a guy called Dr. Norman Doidge 
called The Brain That Changes Itself, highlighted the fact that throughout our lives, our brains continually remould themselves in response to experience. And it's possible to improve your brain's capacity, and in our case, particularly your brain's learning capacity, by doing certain types of mental exercises. And so these products, they're neuroscience products. They've been designed and built by um, some of the world's most renowned brain scientists to specifically work on the parts of the brain that improve your ability to learn. So that's what this is. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And so for listeners who perhaps aren't quite ready for a product, is there stuff that, I mean, can someone be doing exercises at home just on their own? Is there, from a neuroscience standpoint? You can. I mean, anything you do has the potential to change your brain in a positive or negative way. But the value of doing things that are designed based on science is that they are the right exercises and to do something yourself is really pretty hit and miss, you know. Okay, uh, I, I guess I was sort of talking about things like crosswords and Sudoku oh, seem to oh. come up as sort of things that you should do to stave off dementia and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah abs- absolutely, you know, keep your brain active. There was actually a, a famous thing called the nun study where a whole bunch of 80-year-old nuns were studied in the US and they had very, very low levels of dementia and the, they discovered the reason was that all these nuns, it was a sort of a, a writing order of nuns. They, they uh, kept diaries and wrote, you know, their experiences and stuff and, and apparently that the act of being mentally alert and writing had a major protective wow. impact. So all sorts of interesting things in this area, Toby. Yeah, yeah. It, it is fascinating. I mean, there seems so much, you know, your ability to learn as opposed to what can be learned, as opposed to the knowledge itself, like the speed of learning is such, I think, is something that's going to become more and more important considering we can get access to so much information for free now online and everything else. Absolutely. There's tons of information. It's how you assimilate that information, how you learn it. And um, that's the big new frontier. There's, I think we're on the beginning of a wave of um, change in education and learning. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? I mean, certainly... The models that I've seen, places like the Khan Academy and some of the online sort of models that are flipping traditional education on its head fascinates me. Absolutely. now with a little bub. (laughs) Yeah. Well, if you or any of your listeners are interested, there's a fabulous book called Disrupting Class that talks about this whole Khan Academy and, you know, all the stuff we're doing. It's written by a Harvard professor called Clayton Christensen, and it describes what's happening in this whole education and how the the monolithic educational institutions, schools, universities, all that are being disrupted by technology. Mm. And it's just really interesting reading if that's something that's um, of interest to to you. Yeah. Is he the one who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma? That's the guy. Ah, gotcha. I mean, that's another book that's on my list. But thanks, (laughs) Pete. There's, There's two more to read for my homework. So, Pete, let's jump into your sort of business journey, I guess, and marketing, obviously, because mm-hmm. that's what the, you know, particularly what this show is about. I mean, broadly speaking, what is your marketing philosophy? And I'd be interested to know, has it changed over the years? Oh, absolutely. When, when, I, when I first started in this back in the sort of, oh, God, I think, when was it? You know, maybe eight years or so, we were still using, still mailing out paper brochures to people. Mm. It's totally changed. And the big change has, has been the, the realisation that, that inbound is the way to go. And no longer it's, you know, it's trying to knock on people's doors when they're not interested, but to have a dance with them and, and give them information that they potentially find useful and form a relationship and then have them ask about the products and services when they're ready. That's been the big, big, big change for me. Mm. I mean, that's certainly been our realisation as well over the last 10 years or so has been, you know, what is the philosophy that particularly underpins web marketing and that whole idea of access to information, the shift away from the company controlling the information to, you know, the consumer having access to it at their fingertips is um, an extraordinary change, I think. Absolutely. And what I like about it too is that by the time we're talking to a, a prospect, they've really done a lot of research because they can, on 
what we've got, the alternatives, the issues, the challenges, you know, all, all that stuff. And it's then it's much, it's a very nice, productive conversation. And in terms of business, we're not burning salespeople's time on low value prospect. Yeah. Uh, so it's that's it's an not. interesting. I mean, that's an interesting sort of saving almost, isn't it? Absolutely, it having is, educated yeah. prospects. Yeah, totally. Mm. Oh, that's mm. an interesting observation. And so what are you guys up to then in terms of your marketing for LearnFast? Oh, gosh, we're doing all sorts of stuff. We're using HubSpot and Salesforce as our kind of core platforms. Oh, uh, yeah, because HubSpot was how we sort of first met, I think, was you were considering that and then Dave introduced us. Stanley. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. And I mean, we're really, really happy with HubSpot. It's a wonderful, you know, I feel a bit like at times I was saying to one of the people in the office the other day, I feel, you know, like, you know, George Bush's shock and awe thing in um, <laughs> in Iraq. <laughs> that we got this, like, this nuclear weapon at our disposal called HubSpot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's just powerful. Mm. But you've got to do it and you've got to stitch it all together. And so what we're doing, there's about 10 different elements that we're working with at the moment. We're doing email marketing. We're, you know, we're starting to use infographics. A nice little tool called Flavellas. I'm not sure whether you've come across those, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Using those, um, we've uh, got. Can some- you just explain for people listening what a Flavella actually entails, Pete? Yeah, yeah. It's like a little mini. It's a sort of a cross between a, a website and a presentation. The one I've, I was just working on this morning, we've got four screens actually, and it just is a simple way of describing anything you want to describe or giving a message. Uh, easy for the user and very um, a nice experience for the user. Mm. Is that kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep. So what kind of information do you present in a Flavella, say, versus an infographic? I mean, what's an example of what content you're actually putting into it? Well, I don't think there's any, you know, I think you can use, pretty much use both mediums to present the same message. Mm. Now, with the Flavella, it's nice. It, it, you know, you can let people click to get additional information and so forth. Right. You know? So you um, can sort of embed the links within yeah, it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Whereas an infographic, you can't really do that, I don't think, can you? No, it, you're it, pretty it, limited, it, I think. Yeah. 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 So we're using those things. We've got some recorded webinars that um, we've started to use, and they, they that's sort of getting some traction. We got a whole pile of videos. We got a YouTube channel that's had two hundred thousand views uh, of our videos. Wow! And we're just trying to figure out. You know, we, we, we used to have all that stuff just public, and now we're starting to make them private and use them in other ways. That's a whole new sort of project. We got to get our heads around. Why are you sort of moving potentially to private videos? I think with the public videos, we don't really get. It's hard for us to see the value because mm-hmm. there's people kind of all over the world, not in our markets and so forth, clicking on them. That's probably a relevant constraint to sort of discuss as well is that you have geographic boundaries around where you can sell specifically, hey, because of your yes. licensing agreements and stuff. Yeah, with the, with the product manufacturer, yes. So yeah. we, we can't just sell anywhere in the world. Mm. We, we, we have to sell in, in, in our geography. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and and, I, and I'm just thinking that if we um, make these private, then we can turn them into premium content and things like that, and so we're collecting information from people who are interested in all yeah, of that. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. make it sort of that opt-in process, or I mean, would it be something that you'd even end up getting people to pay for, or? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Down the track, that's one avenue we're moving. This whole concept of having product at different price points. So, yes, yes. We, we did play around in the early days when we started to do these videos to, to try and sell them, but it didn't sort of work. And I think it was partly because we didn't have the audience, but now we've got a, a much bigger audience. Yeah, okay. And we're building that all the time. So, yeah. And then we got our newsletter, the monthly newsletter that goes out to 25,000 people. It has an open rate of 33 or 4%, which we just love, which is unbelievably good. We've and started. What do, what do you think that is, Pete? Do you think it's a, um, like you've got the open rate and you've also got some pretty solid click-through rates too, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's the fact that there's a need out there. People want the sort of information we're giving. Mm. We give a variety of, the newsletters, it's a rich 
if I say so myself, <laughs> a, ri- a rich newsletter. It's got a whole variety of different things in there. It looks good. And the people have got the ability to dig in and get more. And um, and I think over time we've got a bit of a reputation now. Or we're getting a reputation that you know it's pretty good. You know, people mm-hmm. like the thing and they share it with their friends, which is nice. So we're building our database that way. We've also started to dip our toe in the podcast world and um, we've got a couple of podcasts which are really getting some traction so we're looking at doing a lot more of that blogs we've now got over a hundred blogs published and that's starting to work for us Mm -hmm. a bunch of landing pages related to all of that stuff of course and you know and our website so all of that and the emails i just figured out yesterday we're now sending um sixty five thousand emails a week a week um, a week a week currently, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah which is, uh, and, you know, and I think that's, we've had a big kick up in um, leads recently, and I think that's, we've bumped up from about 20,000 to 60,000, and I think that's just having a big impact. You know, someone said some time back, oh, email's dead, it's not dead, not for us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's certainly a part of the process, I think, you know, in terms of a relationship with a customer is that, if they're prepared to let you into your, their inbox, then you know you do need to be respectful of that and deliver value all the time. But if you're getting those sort of click-through rates and open rates, then you must be doing a lot right. Yeah, well, yes, it seems that way. So we just got to keep doing it and do it even better. And, wh- and one of the big challenges for us is with all that stuff I've just mentioned. Yeah, how- that's a ton. <laughs> yeah, and how do you stitch it together and make it make sense for, for the audience and, and all of that? So... What we've realized recently is that we need help with this sort of stuff. So, you know, getting expert external help makes a difference, you know? Yep. Not trying to do this stuff on your own because it's, you know, you can spend 24 hours every day reading stuff about how to do this, Mm. but actually doing it and making sense of all the options is, is the big thing, I think. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of information. I mean, you mentioned HubSpot. Their blog alone would be um, decades of reading, I think. Absolutely, yes. Um, and, you know, so much of it is great quality stuff. It's not like they're pumping out rubbish. So, yeah, that's a real real challenge, I think. Yeah. And, Pete, on that front, I guess, in terms of, you know, that is a lot of things that you have been doing for a long time. Well, how long have you been doing all that activity? Because it sounds like... Well, some of it's quite recent, like, you know, podcasts, um, favelas, infographics, set, that and webinars, that's really quite recent. The videos, are, you know, started about four years ago. The email stuff really is only in the last couple of years. Yep. And blogs, and- is, blogs just in the last, last year. Yeah, right. 100 blogs in a year, that's a good effort. Yeah, not that's bad. That's a great effort, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, what kind of impact has that had on, on the business? Um, we get some leads from the blogs, you know, calls to action at the bottom of blogs. All, all of that activity all, all, as all opposed of, to just the blogging. All, all of that activity. It's enabled us to do a couple of things. One is to sort of change our sales processes. So where we used to have a, a bunch of people just ringing anyone who sort of pop, popped their nose up above the parapet sort of thing <laughs> yep. and, th- and that was uh, th- poor buggers <laughs> <laughs> absolutely poor buggers both sides of the fence you know and that costs money and um, so we, we've now got the sales process much more refined as a result of this so we're getting more more value for our sales spend we've totally eliminated paid advertising which is just great and and we've totally eliminated paying for SEO as well courtesy of HubSpot's built-in SEO smarts. So, yeah, that's that, that have been the big impacts, I guess. Yeah, okay. Mm. That's mm. great. Thanks. Yeah. So, Pete, one of the things that, you know, you sort of talked about some of the stuff that's been going, working pretty well, but can you share any stories about what hasn't worked or and perhaps what you've either done differently or what you might do differently next time? Yeah, well, a couple of things. We've over the years had a whole bunch of different websites, but for quite a while, we had a website that was really static and it just got so out of date, it was just not working for us. So that, that was one thing that I realized that we, you know, you've got to keep, keep on this thing because the markets move and, you know, you've got to keep updating and changing things. Another thing was we really got slammed in our consumer market back in, I think it was 2003. 
that was about the time we, we realized we had to think about upgrading or changing, redoing the website. And I think Google were making some algorithm changes. In 2003, did you say Sorry, 13, 13. Okay. Sure. 2013. And our consumer leads just fell through the floor. Mm. And I think we just didn't understand what was going on. So that stuff was a hard lesson for us, really. It took us quite a while to recover from that yep. in that market. Yeah, sure. So you kind of, in terms of correcting those changes, I guess, did you? so you went back and redid the website. I know, you know we were talking around that time and working together on this kind of stuff, but sort of we started off with the website. You know, what's been the road back, do you feel? Well, I think all the things that we've done recently, following on from that website, just revamping the whole process, those nine or ten marketing elements I was talking about before, the Flavellas infographics, you know, videos, all that stuff, Mm. that's all evolved from that point. We went, oh, God, what's happening? Then started talking to you and we redid the website and then from then we've progressively been working and refining and building all these other elements. So that's really what happened. Yeah, okay. And you actually mentioned the leads recently because that's particularly on the school side of things for your business. Yes. And I'm interested in that because I think you know there's been a real aha moment there in terms of jumping up your email activity. Can you walk us through what you think has happened there and kind of what you've done specifically as well with that yeah. email activity? Yeah, sure, sure. We were really too timid in the past with emails, I believe. You know, we had, we've had we got a bunch of people in, in the team who would say, oh, God, you can't send them a second email this week because, you know, they mightn't like it. <laughs> they mightn't too. Anyway, but that was a belief. So we've tested that and so far uh, we haven't had a whole pile of unsubscribes or anything. Right. So what we're doing is we've just created a couple of campaigns around – One's around a product, which is a an online reading tutor. It uses voice recognition, and it's just really, really a neat product. And the other one is around the concept. This is not selling the product. This is just education. The concept that the way forward in education and learning is to – improve the capacity of the student's brain to learn. You know, you can do as much as you like by having the best teachers and the best curriculum and all of that gear. But if the student's not ready to learn, well, you're going to bang it up against the wall. So we've got both those campaigns. We've got emails, we've got videos, um, we've got downloads, we've got all sorts of stuff. And there's about, in each of those, there's about nine different marketing pieces that go out via email over a, over a period yeah, what, what uh, sort of period? It's not that long. We've only just started doing this. So on each campaign, two emails a week. Yep. So on the first one, I think it's Monday and Thursday, and the other one's Tuesday and Friday or something like that. And so that's going to last for four or five weeks. Yep. And then, depending on what happens, we'll just run them again. Um, mm. And we're gonna, when we're building out other similar sort of things to use. So I think, I think our, what we're learning is that, We need to be communicating a message in multiple ways, and I think we're going to be adding other elements to this too, like infographics and stuff to make it more appealing and do a fair bit of it. Um, You know, the danger is that we're going to bother people with all this stuff, but if we do, we can change it because you don't know unless you give it a go and you've got to test things. Yeah, absolutely. But so far, so good. We've, yeah, that's, that's it's great. Kicked, it's kicked up, kicked up a big bunch of extra leads significantly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's mm. awesome. And if we can, like, really dive into some detail around this, like, of those nine messages, like, can you talk us through, you know, what is the sort of substance of those? Yeah. Can you talk us through the substance of it and perhaps even, like, are you making offers within that or is it pure education of the prospect, I guess? How do you break that down? Okay, in the what I call the learning capacity campaign, yeah. the beginning few of those are just education. It's just this is the idea. This is targeting the schools, is it? This is targeting schools, okay. yes. Both of these are targeting schools. Sure. So in that one, the first few emails are about, hey, did you realize that this is an issue? And then sort of, okay, then so what is the issue? It's this. 
then we let them see that for a little video. And if they, then the next email will be um, sort of, I hope you found that um, thought provoking. If you'd like to know more about it, here's a podcast, and that sort of thing. Right. And, and that's really got no product in it at all. Mm. I think from memory, towards the end of that, we've got product. Oh, yeah, that's right. Along the way, we're starting to say, well, if you really, if you want to talk to a specialist about this stuff, we're here. Okay. Okay. And just sort of making your phone number readily available and that yes. sort of thing. Yes, yes, yeah, yep. yeah. With the um, the other one, the product campaign, it's a little more product. It's, wow, this thing's, this is unbelievably powerful for your students and for you as a teacher, how would it be if you could have a reading coach, one-to-one reading coach for every kid in your class where you can just sit back and look look at the, the data, look at their progress on your screen or on your mobile or wherever. Mm. And then, you know, so that's the idea of it. And then that message sort of spun in different ways, you know, from the point of view of reading fluency what are they comprehending, uh, vocabulary improvement, all those stuff. So different messages and different subject lines and things like that. Oh, mm. well, that's great. Pete. Mm. Thanks for sharing that detail because I think, you know, getting into the detail of how these mechanics actually work, and that's an automated sequence, right? Yes, yep. yes. Okay. Yeah. What's your sort of decision point as to whether or not you put someone into that sequence or not? To begin with, it's basically every, everybody on this, the school database, but we started doing it geographically. So we, we started in Victoria to begin with just to sort of see how it went. Sure. And then we, we widened it out to other, other states and New Zealand. So you've actually segmented your database into teachers versus like your home consumers. Is yes, that- yes, okay. yes, yes, we do that. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, and what, thanks for sharing all that. No worries. What we're hoping to do is to get more granular than that, and that we're building up within the school thing, for example, the job roles, so principals, curriculum directors, and those sort of people who who will respond or have different interests than your classroom teacher, for example. Yeah. And so how will you go about sort of gathering that data on, on your contacts? Well, we've got someone um, up in the Philippines who's coming through school websites and getting principals' names and things like that. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, but it is a manual process as opposed to an automated process. Yeah, there's no so, list that well, I, you know, there's nowhere I, that I know of. I can just get a list of all principals in, you know, no. in, in New South Wales, for example. Sure. Yeah. And there's no sort of qualification process in your sort of lead capture, I guess. Well, yeah, um, it's pretty rudimentary. I mean, we do have a field which I think is op- – well, it is optional. You know, what's your job role? Um, right. And we, we are collecting some principles from that. Yep. But, yeah, we need that another whole area where I'd love to, to be able to get more sophisticated with that. Mm. Oh, sounds like a great starting point, though, particularly if it's having that impact already. Yeah, yeah, no, we're happy. Yeah, that's awesome. So, Pete, what would you say has been your sort of most surprising – result then so far? <laughs> well, I guess the most surprising thing is we've traditionally worked in sort of the area of reading and literacy and so forth. And we pumped out a, a free maths kind of worksheet tool recently. And the most surprising thing was, well, it's probably not surprising, give some, offer something free, people will take it. <laughs> 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 it's been our most popular download ever. Right. And so we've got huge numbers of people getting this freebie and giving it to their friends. And so we're growing our database from that. So that was sort of like a surprise to me. Wow. You know, so then the next question is, what do we do with all these people who are so interested in this? And because we haven't got a product we can sell at this stage. So we're working on developing a, a saleable maths product. Fantastic. Mm. And so that kind of reverse engineer, now that you know the demand is there, I guess yeah. you can find a product to fit, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, that's great. Mm. And so what do you see sort of happening next then for Learn Fast, Pete? Well, I just want us to be able to repeat what we're doing consistently and just you know make sure we know what we need to do to keep driving the leads. I think it's a never-ending kind of journey of learning and experimenting and testing and and it's being done in a background where the market isn't static, you know. 
technology is changing massively fast. People's interests are changing. You know, so whatever you do one day is not necessarily going to work the next. So that's sort of, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the fun of it, I suppose. Yeah, the fun and the challenge at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. One, one of the big things, um, I think it was you that said this to me, you know, recently, build, build your audience and then figure out how to monetize it. I think that's really, I think what we're going to end up doing is we're growing our audience and we want to really grow that a lot bigger. And then we've got an opportunity to, construct products or acquire products to sell to that. So we're going to end up widening out our product range, you know, types of products, price points and all of that. Mm. So that's, that's exciting me. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm. And, I mean, you've got such a strong community around you already that it's a huge opportunity for you. Yep. Great, Pete. Well, thanks so much for sharing all that detail. I really appreciate it. One thing I wanted to get to was um, 100 blogs in 12 months is – Pretty solid effort, particularly for someone who's sort of starting out on that. But I remember you saying you were a journalist at one point. And, uh, and yeah. how, how have you found sort of returning to you in a journalist? Oh, I love it. It's just so much fun. You know, I've sort of turned right back to, yeah, I was a finance journalist way back then. I've turned back to that sort of um, craft, if you like, uh, in a whole new, you know, digital environment and sort of different writing requirements. And it's just great fun. And I'm sort of figuring now we've kind of Instead of being a sort of, we're kind of almost becoming a publisher. <laughs> so it's fun. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. David Mim and Scott's quote is, think like a publisher. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, great fun. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. Mm. So, Pete, who do you learn from? Oh, everybody. Well, experts <laughs> uh, who I talk to. I read, read heaps, you know. There's, I remember the first time I got an a, a inkling about this whole inbound thing was a book written by a guy called Scott Brinker called Honest Seduction. He publishes a blog called Chief Marketing Technologist. And I, so I follow that guy. It's, it's, you know, I've learned stuff from him. You know, books. I mean, the marketing lessons of the Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got it? What's, what's the book on the go at the moment? Um, I've been reading Fast and Slow Thinking by uh, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've started that as well. Yeah, that's great, eh? Yeah, it's pretty in- incredible insight into human behavior, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And another good one I've just actually finished reading is a, a book called The Art of Choosing. Okay. Which has got a whole lot of interesting sort of psychology in it about um, how people choose things. Hmm. Have you got one particular book that you felt has sort of either changed your life or changed your worldview? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's so many of them, really. I mean, one set of books I really did enjoy uh, over the last year or two was um, the stuff Nicholas Nassim Taleb's written, you know, Anti-Fragile, Black Swan, all those ones, or yeah. those three. He's got three of them. Well, I'm a huge fan of those. <laughs> Peter's yeah, role. yeah, well, just wonderful those things, mm. just wonderful. And one of his concepts, the the barbell concept. Yes, you know, sort of. Uh, at one end, you have um, an invincible. So, well, he was talking about investment portfolios, but it can apply to all sorts of things. Mm. Um, something that's a rock solid, conservative. You know, it's not going to bust open. It's not going to collapse. Um, and then at the other end of the barbell, you can then afford to play with high risk potentially high reward strategies mm. so so that i really like yeah anti-fragile is actually my answer to that question which is what's a book that's changed your worldview because i just think it's so important it's actually come up on numbers of interviews on this podcast actually so oh, really oh that's yeah. interesting oh eh? yeah. yeah 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 no i, I agree it, it's just a um, you know wow <laughs> yeah yeah I've, mm. I've found the same and pete's Last couple of questions. Do you have a favourite quote or piece of advice that you use for inspiration? Actually, I don't. You know, no. I don't. No, I don't. I don't have anything on the wall. Although I, on the wall, I have you know what success means to me. Oh yeah. And there's a couple of elements in there. Is there anything you're prepared to share if it's up there next to you? But um, yeah, don't, don't feel obliged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the elements is you know the freedom to go anywhere in the world when I choose and continue doing the things I like from any location. That's, a, that's one of the success criteria. Yep. And this whole marketing thing, you know, my objective is, is to have a marketing process that I'm able to run from the kitchen table wherever I am in the world. 
Great. And uh, another element of that, I won't give you them all, but another element of that is to have um, happy, successful children and, and grandchildren independently um, making their own way through the world, you know, doing things that they want to do and making a difference. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, mate. I love those. Mm. That's really, uh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, they all ring very true for me too. Pete, the final question then is how can listeners connect with you to find out more? Oh, probably the easiest way is to just email me, uh, peter at learnfastgroup.com.au. Fantastic. And your website is learnfasthome.com.au, right? Yes, that's it. Fantastic. Well, Pete, thanks so much for joining me and it's been an absolute pleasure to hear all the detail and thanks so much for sharing it all. Yeah, Tubby, well, thank you. I, I've enjoyed our chat. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk soon. Thanks. Uh, okay, bye. This show is brought to you by our 33 free marketing templates. You can download them at bluewiremedia.com.au slash book. Now, we would love your feedback. We would love your questions and also any guest suggestions. You can contact me on email. I am toby.jenkins at bluewiremedia.com.au or on Twitter, I am at toby underscore Jenkins. Also, if you enjoyed the show, we would love it if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks so much and see you next time. (laughs) 